but I think that we're building right now the foundational building blocks on, on law and science to really begin a very strong kelp farming and, and kelp industry here in the United States. Um, so it's just, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you guys here today. Hello, and a very warm welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the director of Cambridge Forum, and today we have a big, tasty topic to savour. Seaweed. Yes, some of you may be turning up your noses, thinking only of seaweed as some slimy, smelly stuff wrapping around your legs and your anchors in the ocean, a beach blighter, and something that's not much good for anything except sushi. Well, you couldn't be more wrong. This wonderful aquatic organism possesses multiple useful applications, as witnessed by the increasing number of marine scientists, ecologists, entrepreneurs, and foodies who are starting to appreciate seaweed's remarkable properties. To prove how harnessing the power of seaweed might help us save the planet, we have three great guests from around the world today, each of whom has dedicated his life to seaweed in some way or another. But before we get to the introductions, let's begin with a brief synopsis about seaweed. It has enormous applications which range from farming to farmer, from food source to packaging. Seaweed can also play a huge role in fighting climate change by absorbing carbon. Some species can take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere at five times the rate of land-based plants. In addition to being a sustainable food source for humans and animals, it's also one of the fastest growing plants. So if seaweed reduces emissions, regenerates marine ecosystems, creates biofuel and renewable plastics, and can generate protein in the global food supply, some would question why has it taken so long for this centuries old industry to migrate west from Asia, which currently dominates over 90% of the world's commercially farmed seaweed market. Well, to help us answer that question and several others, let me introduce the three super knowledgeable seaweed experts today. Joining us first from Ireland, Dr. Stefan Kran is a Dutch marine biologist who now lives in Galway, where he's founder of the Seaweed Company. Sean Barrett is founder of Dr. Dish and the Montauk Seaweed Supply Company in Long Island. And Vincent de Moselle is joining us from France, where he is head of the Safe Seaweed Coalition and senior advisor for the UN Global Compact. So welcome to you all three. So good evening, Stefan, to you in Ireland. Uh, you're a marine biologist originally from Holland who came to Galway to study over 20 odd years ago and you fell in love with seaweed. So tell me about how your interest evolved from marine research in the lab to seaweed fertilizer production, and then diversifying into other areas and to other countries. And why are you excited about the global prospects for seaweed? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Mary, for inviting me to this forum and also Cambridge Forum to host this. Uh, yes, seaweed is an uh, inherent part of my life, but it, it's much longer, actually, it's 35 years. And I studied seaweeds in a time uh, in the Netherlands uh, at the university where all my fellow students were looking at dolphins or whales or fish. And I was the odd one out looking at seaweeds. Now, there was a working group or a department in our university that was dealing with seaweeds. So that's where I started uh, getting, well, immersed basically in the world of seaweeds. And in the first instance, it was about the beauty of seaweeds. Uh, if you dry seaweeds on, on a special cardboard or paper, you get the really nice prints. And I once made all my Christmas cards like that for the whole family, but you do that only once because it's a lot of work, I can tell you. But that, that captured my imagination with seaweeds. And then I started to learn about why seaweeds are growing in a certain area, because it's constricted by temperature, by day length, by light and all these kind of stuff. And it evolved more and more, and I started really studying it, and then went to Ireland to, to do my PhD, basically, in seaweed, in aquaculture, as well as molecular genetics. So that is how it all started, basically. And then how did you hop from the lab to business? 
Well, I, I was lucky that after my PhD, we set up the Irish Seaweed Industry Organization and the Irish Seaweed Center. And the Irish Seaweed Center was a research center in the university. And in a way, I was lucky that I was able to, to basically manage that. I had my own PhDs and postdocs at the time, run that for about 10 years. But I came to a level where I had to make a, well, basically a decision because I, I got to the stage where either if I wanted to make promotion, my professor had to die. And the good man is still alive, he's still a friend. Uh, and he's quite famous, actually, Professor Mike Guyery. Um, so I was going to do this, what I was doing the rest of my life. Or I was, well, basically resigning and going to do something else. And that was going to do business, but with seaweeds, applied mycology, as we call it, looking for applications of seaweeds in all the marvelous things that we do nowadays with seaweeds. And fertilizer is one, but pharma and, and medical applications or bioplastics or food or feed are other applications. So that is where we started about 15 years ago with a company called Ocean Harvest Technology. And I run that for 10 years, and that was purely focused on animal feed applications. And then I stepped out of that and set up the seaweed company, and now we do the whole spectrum from fertilizer to pharma. Interesting. And you did that about uh, 2019, I believe, you set that company Well, the up. seaweed company we set up in 2019, basically, yeah, correct. Right. And you've re recently uh, had some sort of a Dutch merger. How differently, first of all, the Dutch... How do they farm seaweed? Because they don't have the off-coast seaweed farms that, that we have in other parts of the world. And how different do the Dutch handle seaweed as compared to the old honored hand-hewn method they used to have in Galway? I don't know if you still harvest by hand in Galway. Well, the, to, to come to that last point, yes, there is still a lot of hand harvesting, uh, 25,000 tons to be precise. Wow. But it is uh, one type of seaweed, ascophyllum or feminine we, as they call it in Gaelic. And it's used mainly for horticulture, agriculture and animal feed. And that industry started in 1949, just after the Second World War, and is still ongoing. And they do the right thing in the way they sustainably harvest and uh, treat their own resource, because it's still there, still bountiful, still in the same way. The Dutch, on the other hand, only have basically sandy beaches. So no seaweed. You need rock for seaweeds to attach to. And only in the south, in Zeeland, which is the most southerly pro province, they have dikes, uh, the, the eastern Scheldt. Uh, that's where there is some seaweed. And that Dutch farm called Zeewaar, they, well, re we recently took that over. And they have a small seaweed farm, uh, only three, basically, hectares in a small enclosed area in a harbor. So the methodology is still the same. How they grow seaweeds and how we do here in Ireland is the same kind of methodologies with seed and string and ropes and all this kind of stuff. Okay, well, we're going to get into that in a minute so people understand how it actually uh, goes from being a spore on a rope and then how you harvest it and the logistics of it. But let's move over to Montauk now, to you, Sean. Um, Sean farms seaweed commercially um, I think you started off as a fisherman and then you founded the Dr. Dish community-based fishery program. And then last year you founded the Montauk Seaweed Supply Company. So what spurred the move uh, to produce seaweed as a natural form of fertilizer for farms and gardens and golf courses? And why did you get fired up about it? Uh, not just as a business prospect, but as part of a kind of holistic community environmental uh, impact organization yeah great questions mary and uh it was vincent and stefan's work that really got me fired up about it um so it's great to be here with you guys today and i want yeah we started i began uh working as a very young kid um i was fascinated and obsessed with oceans and fish and was just uh my parents used to say um they'd have to pry the fishing rod out of my hands when i was a very young young boy so i started an early obsession with oceans and sea life. Um, and then had just always had a very strong um, attachment and pursuit uh, of trying to create ways to conserve uh, the ocean kind of resources. So starting from a very early age, um, I began memorizing all the different types of fish and learning all I could about oceans and aquatic ecosystems, birds uh, became my kind of 
uh, obsession or passion. So that led us over the years to start working in fisheries. Um, Dr. Dish, as you mentioned, was uh, we, we borrowed some ideas from some farmers here in the US. Uh, we, have, we, had, we still have some um, major supply chain issues at times, but going back 10 or 15 years ago, um, we, we were trying to solve the problem of long supply chains in seafood and fisheries where we saw was a lot of the problems. So uh, there was a concept, once again, something that the US had borrowed from, uh, from Europe, uh, I think began in France, but community supported agriculture. Uh, we borrowed that model and started to create community supported fisheries here in the US. That was the genesis, the origin of uh, the Dr. Dish program where um, we really focused on the chain of custody of how where through the ocean and the fishermen uh, with, you know, the fishermen is one set of hands. There was one person in the middle and then the final uh, destination. So three hands in the chain of custody. We really focused on trying to create small supply chains for things. Um, but concurrently, uh, the kelp uh, kind of conversation in the US about 10 years ago um, on the East Coast here of the US, a company called Atlantic Sea Farms originally was called Ocean Approved. They're up in Maine. And they came down to New York and approached us to work with them and help them try to introduce kelp as a food source. So naturally in the seafood world, in our proximity to New York City, we were doing a lot of work with advanced forward thinking chefs and how to, the Google Corporation, a lot of big companies that had become members of our community supported fishery. So there was a natural kind of um, marriage there between the main kelp farmers who were trying to introduce kelp as food into our seafood um, system. And we began bringing kind of main kelp, sugar kelp is what we grow here in as a, as a food substance um, and began trying to get Americans to, uh, to like to eat kelp, which, which we learned many lessons along the way, as we always uh, do. But um, but yeah, that kind of brought us to um, one of the bigger problems that we have in seafood in, in processing, especially, is waste. Uh, so about six or seven years ago, we were working in seafood. We were working with kelp as food. But in our seafood sector, we were creating huge volumes of waste um, and trying to figure out, like, what can we do with all this waste from the processing? And uh, our relationships with some local organic farms in eastern Long Island, we, we learned that the, the farmers were very keen to take the leftover fish waste and start to put that in their soil as, um, you know, to strengthen the soil. Uh, and so we started to freeze a lot of our, you know, the leftovers from the fish processing and then bring that to the farmers and they start to use that to strengthen their soil. So then the light turned on for me then that, hey, what would happen if we started to kind of harness these nutrients and things that are in the fish? Often there's similar in the, in the kelp and, and aquatic vegetation. Um, what if we started to push kelp and seaweed into the soil? So this kind of like thinking, this vision was going around for a while, but then I got very humbled by uh, the Shinnecock um, Nation, which is an indigenous tribe in Eastern Long Island, who I thought I had had this really brilliant idea and was running around telling everyone about it. And a few of my friends from uh, the Shinnecock Nation were like, dude, this is like, we've been doing this for thousands of years. This is a very ancient indigenous uh, practice. So since that time, we've worked pretty closely with them. They've now started the, the uh, Shinnecock Kelp Farmers. Um, and we were trying to begin this sea to soil movement where I think um, here in Eastern Long Island, the number one problem as inhabitants of the planet, I think that we're all trying to address is carbon capture. So that's the, the most you know, compelling thing about kelp farming to us is its ability to capture carbon. And then we're putting that straight into soil and sequestering, pulling it out of, um, you know, of the atmosphere basically. So our hope is that there's still a lot of science and I'm sure Vince can speak to this, but, um, you know, about carbon capture in uh, the kelp space, number one. But for us, right behind that is nitrogen. So we suffer in Eastern Long Island from, we're in the top 5% of the highest nitrogen content in our local waterways. Um, and it continually causes shellfish die-offs, fish kills. Um, every few weeks, you'll hear someone's pet goes in, drinks the water, and there's all types of hypoxic events and, and problems with nitrogen loading that's coming from the golf courses, the farms, agricultural runoff from New York City. Um, so one of the most compelling right <clears throat> behind carbon was the nitrogen 
sequestering capacity for these kelp farms. And so we're trying to solve a whole bunch of different problems in one and that we, we continually hear about kelp being this kind of miracle, uh, seaweed, you know, being this miraculous. Um, but I think what we're focused on here right now in Eastern Long Island, because we are still so new compared to, um, to Europe and certainly to Asia, the United States is, is way, we're last. We're like way, way, we're, we're so far behind. Uh, we feel like we're in first place, but, um, but I think that we're building right now the foundational building blocks on, on law and science to really begin a very strong kelp farming and, and kelp industry here in the United States. Um, so it's just, it's an honor and a privilege to be with you guys here today. And um, yeah, we're at montauksteaweed.com for anyone who'd like to check us out. Very good. Okay, well, um, I think people, somebody's written a couple of questions in here and one was actually a question I had lined up for you. Um, just to keep, briefly, could you explain the process of how you are farming seaweed? Uh, if it's not being, you know, harvested straight off the beach, you have to create these lines and then put the spores. So if you could explain that a little bit. And then also you talked to me a bit about creating an ecosystem where in that environment you could have mussels and perhaps oysters as well at different levels. So I'm interested in how you would keep that healthy and controlled and organic because you care about that stuff. Yeah, great questions. And I think um, to the first part of the question, structurally, how do you create uh, kelp farms? It differs dramatically on where you're building them, what species you're growing, what type of water, sheltered areas, open ocean, inshore. What we've begun here in New York um, now is only our third year uh, is inshore kelp farming in shallow water, only six to eight feet. We're learning a lot of lessons about the pros and cons of that. Specifically, ice uh, has been teaching us some humbling lessons the last few winters. Um, but it, it's relatively straightforward. I mean, you have a buoy system with some rope. Um, you have some spores on, on a line that go around there. And if you have the right growing conditions, uh, kelp in certain areas. We grow a sugar kelp here um, that's a native to our area. Uh, and that can grow pretty rapidly uh, if it's got the right conditions. But there are all types of variables. Anytime you're dealing with the wild, uh, the open ocean, um, you know, you have to understand like the ocean is the boss, the natural elements. So <laughs> it differs um, where you're growing, where you're, where you're located, your farms. Uh, but we basically had to create the, the first legal framework in New York State. It was not legal to farm kelp up until this year. Until uh, the end of the last year, right? Yeah, yeah, we would be working tribal. for years. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So we had the kelp bill finally got passed, which, uh, was, you know, it was legal to uh, grow and sell the other weed, but seaweed was still outlawed. So we knew we had to balance that, uh, balance that out. So, um, but yeah, I think to, uh, to answer the original question, it's all shapes um, and sizes. We see kelp farms, if the Safe Seaweed Coalition on their website, I've seen um, them give examples in Asia of these enormous mile kilometer long kelp farms, uh, you know, but here in New York, we have small artisanal, um, these are independently operated. And I think the second part of your question, what we're really trying to do is create polyculture farms. So nature really does not like it when you farm just monocultures. We've seen a lot of mistakes that have been made on land in farming. We're trying very hard to avoid um, making those same mistakes in, in the water. And one of the great ones is to just grow one singular species of anything. So we know diversity is the key to having a successful, balanced, thriving, any type of farm you're going to try to grow, basically. Um, so ultimately, our goal and what we're doing now in New York is basically taking existing oyster farms, bivalves, um, and kind of retrofitting them to become oyster kelp combination farms. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why that is. The oyster farmers are typically experienced watermen who already know a lot of the ecosystem. They have the equipment, they have the boats, they have the experience, the knowledge, the know-how. Um, and so that's ultimately the goal for us is to start to create these small independently owned polyculture um, operations where you're growing a, multiple species, multiple low trophic species in the same, uh, in the same farm. Very good. Before we jump to Vincent, I just want to, somebody's asked a question here, which I think I might even know the answer to a little bit. 
somebody said it's carrageena that's the emulsifier that's in seaweed right that's used in ice cream and toothpaste right anyway he's mm. saying is it harmful for people to eat russ has asked so i i understand where this is coming from uh, because there was some uh, problem with that about five to ten years ago and if you heat carrageenan at a high temperature for a long time the current carrageenan molecule might actually deteriorate into polyols which are smaller molecules oh, okay. and they have been linked with certain cancers oh. so that is where this is stemming from but normal carrageenan is safe to eat no problem okay tons of questions people are really into this about where to where to eat, how to cook, prepare, where to buy, is there a local seaweed to purchase? Um, so I don't know where that person's asking the questions for. I don't know if there's a central repository of that kind of information. But anyway, so let me go to, to Vincent. Bonsoir, Vincent, over there in Saint-Malo. Thank you for joining oh. us at such a late hour. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I see you're in the aquarium, even though it's late. Um, <laughs> So Vincent, you have three hats. You're head of the uh, Safe Seaweed Coalition. You're a senior advisor to the UN Global Compact. And you're also director of the food program at Lloyd's Register Foundation, which is a nonprofit, I think. So yeah. in a nutshell, with all the vast uh, roles you're playing, uh, do you think that seaweed is a wonderfully underestimated subject? Uh, and you've just written a book about it, so you must think it's pretty important. Yes, I did. I did uh, wrote a book uh, which is uh, called The Seaweed Revolution, and we should sign for the English translation this, uh, this year. It's performing very well in France so we, uh, this week, sorry. Um, but, but just to answer your question, I think it is more than uh, Marbeth. I think it is the greatest untapped resource we have on this planet, and, and that has the potential to support addressing some of the most pressing challenges we have in this world. Um, just a, a short story about myself. I come from the food business, so I'm not a seaweed specialist as Stefan is. Uh, I really come from the food business and I worked many years with uh, the likes of the Nestlé CEOs and uh, Cargill and Danone and Mars CEOs, and just realizing that they have no solution uh, to feed the world of tomorrow, uh, meaning that we have 300,000 people in addition to feed every day on the planet. Um, we have to produce because of the um, calories demand and, and the diet changes. We have to provide uh, as much to, super, to, to produce as much food in the next 50 years or so as we ever produced over the last 10,000 years. That's kind of a, a, a complex uh, equation. Uh, and in addition, the yields are stable. Uh, the cities are growing bigger and bigger. And you, you don't have much arable land left and so forth. So we have a big trouble. And in the meantime, we are the first generation to know that these food systems and our economical system in general uh, uh, this food system are the biggest contributor to the greenhouse gas and to climate change, biggest contributor to water scarcity, to soil depletion, to biodiversity loss, uh, and, to, uh, and to social injustice as well. Uh, just remember that uh, coffee, uh, cocoa, and sugar, I mean, you, you for sure had some of these today, uh, are the biggest contributor to modern slavery in the world today. So once again, there's something to change totally, and, and no one uh, has a start of a solution for that. Then you look at the ocean and you realize that 70% of the world is covered by ocean that contribute to less than 2% of the planet, of the food that we have in the planet. So 2% of our calories come from the ocean only, while it covers two thirds of our planet. So if you really want to have a gross avenue in terms of food production, you have to look at the ocean. Um, and, and it's not only, I mean, and basically, uh, if you look at the ocean, if you really want to grow uh, food and other type of resources in a more than sustainable, because talking about sustainability when it comes to the ocean is irrelevant. I mean, we have destroyed already 50% of the ecosystem in the ocean. So uh, talking about sustainability is irrelevant. We have to talk about restoration or regenerative agriculture, uh, which is exactly that what Chan explained. So uh, if we want to start to uh, rebuild ecosystem at sea instead of keeping destroying them as we do right now, seaweed is the very the best place to start because uh, it is the lowest trophic level, so it can really uh, feed and support the other uh, uh, um, uh, the other part of the ecosystem. And then seaweed, I mean, just one thing first, uh, just as I realize and was to say we talk a lot about kelp, but there are various, there's over twelve thousand different type of macroalgae, so seaweed, which are very different. Uh, a green seaweed 
uh, is uh, more different to, uh, from a genetic perspective to a, a, a green seaweed than a fungi, fungi is uh, to an elephant. Huh? So uh, that is really, really different. It's important to note because this wide range of genetic diversity offers an equally uh, 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 wide range of applications. So seaweed for what? Seaweed to support food and diet and human food, of course. I mean, we know that in Japan, seaweed makes up 10% of the food and contribute to, uh, uh, to long life expectancy, low level of cancer, diabetes, obesity, and cardiovascular disease, and so forth. Seaweed is naturally an antifungal, antiviral, um, and, and anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, and a natural prebiotics. So really good for your body, basically. Uh, this is a nutritional bomb. Uh, but it's not, not only this. I mean, it's also good to feed animals with a lot of side benefit. It's also good as a biostimulant to support agriculture. It's also good as a substitute to plastic. We see that the best option to replace plastic may come from seaweed. Actually, there are a lot of amazing startups that are doing a great job at the moment to replace plastic with compostable or even edible uh, uh, packaging. So that's what which would be great. To replace cotton as well. Cotton is 2% of, uh, uh, of the culture in the world and 25% of pesticides and 10% of herbicides. So replacing cotton is not a, a good, uh, it's not a, a, a bad idea. And when we talk about uh, synthetic fibers, this is the biggest contributor to a microplastic pollution. But seaweed has also support massive innovation for medicines. Uh, there are some great, great innovation. We don't have time, I think, here to get into the detail, but really a lot of things that are untapped in terms of medicine. Seaweed can support uh, life in the ocean. It provides marine habitat and support uh, wildlife in the ocean. That's the best way to, uh, to restore abundance in the ocean is to grow seaweed. Seaweed absorb a lot of greenhouse gas as well. I mean, think about, Think of the fact that seaweed can grow up to 40 centimeters a day, for some of them up to 60 meters high. So we should, uh, uh, I mean, this is, this is real forest uh, and, and they can sequester a lot of carbon. And then we should be reminded as well that these forests, these seaweed forests are disappearing, are absorbing as much carbon as the entire Amazon forest, but are disappearing at an even faster pace because of uh, a, a, a global, uh, global challenge we have. And, and so, so there's like a big fire uh, underwater, but no one cares because no one sees that. So that's something to be reminded. So we have to preserve and protect and develop seaweed. Uh, and, and last but not least, seaweed also provide uh, resources and, and jobs and revenue to coastal community where fishing resources are inexorably, uh, inevitably doomed to, uh, to, re to get very re reduced and to decrease uh, and to disappear gradually. And, and most of these uh, jobs and revenues, notably in emerging countries, are going to women. 80% uh, in Africa, for instance, in East Africa, uh, all the revenues from seaweed are going to women. As such, it furthers women empowerment and gender parity in emerging countries, uh, very traditional. So really, it ticks all the boxes. And the big thing in my book is called the seaweed revolution, because it looks like we are still in the stone age when it comes to seaweed. I mean, uh, you mentioned US. US uh, has not yet moved to cultivation. The US is the largest maritime territory in the world, I mean, clearly, uh, and, uh, and it produces less than, less than 0.1% of the global seaweed production in the world. So uh, outcome, we are in the Stone Age. So 12,000 years ago, we moved from prehistory to modern history, and we managed to feed a lot of people, moving from hunters, gatherers to uh, becoming farmers. But yet we have not done this for uh, with the ocean. We are still totally uncivilized with the ocean. So it's time to enter a civilization of the ocean, which is once again two thirds of our planet and ninety percent of the uh, of, of 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 life uh, on Earth. So that that's the idea: move to a new civilization, including the ocean. Um, and uh, and I think. Uh, the first action we should all have, um, especially you English speaking people, uh, we should change the name of uh, seaweed because of the various and many applications that I have seen. I mean, despite I've tried very hard and I know people have tried all across the world, but you cannot smoke seaweed. So seaweed is not weed. So stop calling them seaweed, please. Uh, let's call them uh, sea vegetables as they do in Asia, just people so can understand it's, it's delicious. Just call them sea forests as they do in Norway, for instance, uh, so people can understand we should protect them just like we do with, with forests. Uh, but seaweed is absolutely irrelevant as a name.
Yeah, it's a misnomer. Thank you for, for clarifying Absolutely. that. It's um, so you guys are going to have to change your name from safe seaweed then to something else. exactly <laughs> <laughs> safe greenies oh, or something. Greenies, safe, um, <laughs> safe sea greens. So you've actually brought up some amazing number of points, some of which I was going to ask you about, particularly the climate situation, which um, over farming and, and the famine has caused terrible uh, devastation to people that were making their livelihood um, with, with uh, you know, farming or, or in the ocean. Um, so that, that is a very good point. But the aquaculture, somebody uh, quoted, I read an article um, in Time and he said, the only way to feed the world population by 2050 that doesn't harm the environment is to scale up seaweed fishing now. I always get a little nervous when people say scale up because, you know, I have terrible uh, ideas of what that means. What protections do you think you can afford seaweed's future sustainability so it doesn't become overproduced and then disrupt the ecosystem in the ocean? So first of all, it needs to be science driven. We need to work, which is why we created a coalition, a global coalition of seaweed stakeholders already gathering 800 members because first of all, we need to work correct, collectively and share experience, uh, 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 all of us. Uh, that's the one thing. Remember, seaweed is not something new. I mean, the seaweed revolution has started 60 years ago in Japan, China, and Asia. Uh, today, uh, 36 million tons of seaweed are produced in Asia out of cultivation. 99% of the global production, 97% of the global production in the world come from Asia, so you will uh, uh, first, uh, try to understand why Asia uh, is the only one uh, to use a resource that does not need land, uh, nor uh, fertilizers, uh, and does not need to be water. And this is, of course, uh, seaweed doesn't need fresh water. Um, so, it, and the reason is clear, because they need it first. I mean, uh, they need to feed a fast-growing population back in the 50s. Mao Zedong, or the Japanese after the World War II, they were in huge need of seaweed. And, and in Ireland, as Stefan can, uh, uh, and I can testify that when the, the famine came, the people were eating a lot of seaweed. So we learn about seaweed when we need them. Um, uh, so, so the question of offer of farming looks a bit irrelevant because out of 66 million square kilometers that are suitable to seaweed farming, we only farm uh, 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 2,000 kilometers, square kilometers in the world today. So there's a, a long way to go. Um, seaweed, once again, is $15 billion uh, uh, of revenue in the world. Today, it's 8 million uh, uh, jobs uh, and, uh, and growing at 10% a year in terms of uh, uh, revenues. So that's already massive. It's already there. Uh, the Asia is, is mastering seaweed. Of course, as mentioned by Sean, we should not reproduce the mistakes we did on land. We should avoid monoculture, mm -hmm. uh, GMO, uh, and intensive farming. We should create regenerative model building uh, seaweed uh, in, uh, in collaboration with fish and shellfish and so forth so we could recreate ecosystem in the ocean that were the, the strong power i mean Wageningen calculated some years ago that with two percent of the world dedicated to uh, a, a global permaculture and seaweed production uh, uh, we could feed 12 billion people in protein with no need of animal or vegetable protein which is quite interesting so we are quite far from over farming that said we should be careful and and for that I keep saying my, my commitment to seaweed uh, as part of the UN and so forth is really an intergenerational commitment for the next generation. But I think we, we, I mean, we are responsible of what has happened, of what is happening right now. So we should offer them some solution. And I trust them uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, get, uh, uh, to get a better sense uh, of what is needed for the environment that we had. Uh, uh, the, the, the level of awareness by young generation is very high in terms of uh, being environmentally friendly. So we should trust them, we should leave them a chance. And I think once again, being led by science and making sure that what we do in the ocean will not disrupt it is critical. But also bear in mind, we are already destroying the ocean. I mean, don't think like the ocean is something preserved preserve and untouched. I mean, the ocean is full of plastics. We have destroyed 50% of lives there. It's full of pollutants, of uh, of agricultural runoffs and so forth. So, I mean, we have destroyed the ocean. So it's time to repair them. And that's why we are using seaweed basically to repair the ocean. Okay, so on that, on that very point, there's a couple of things you raised there that, that give me cause for concern. One is um, the Asian form of like 
factory fishing their ships that won't leave a minnow on the floor of, of, of the ocean. They suck everything up with this uh, uh, I mean, terrible waste factor too. So my, I guess my biggest concern would be that the UN would have some kind of policing agency like the EPA that would be monitoring all these large seaweed farms to see what they're up to. Because I, somebody telling me that this is a massive fish farm, uh, a seaweed farm worries me more than impresses me, to be honest with you. I think the small, tightly, carefully organized businesses like Sean and, and Stefan, that I feel a lot happier with that because they're invested in it personally, in what they're doing and the quality of what they're doing. So that's one point. The second thing is, Already on the West Coast, the changing temperature off in the Pacific has decimated the big kelp um, forests on the West Coast. And, and some uh, species of kelp are now moving north because of the temperature of the ocean. So how do we, first of all, protect the balance of the species in the ocean? And is perhaps the answer some of what Norway is doing, which is cultivating seaweed in fjords and bodies of water inland? Um, and if you did that, would it be possible to maintain the organic qualities of your product so it didn't become like a fish farm? So I'm asking a lot of questions there, but... Just on the first point, I mean, creating a, a global institution, UN doesn't, I mean, that which is something which is absolutely insane to me, UN doesn't have any agency for uh, ocean. We have, a, an, uh, we have a convention for climate, we have a convention, convention for biodiversity, we have an agency for food, for uh, health, but nothing for the ocean. There's nothing that, 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 that the, the, the asset that we have the most in common, the ocean. So we have to create uh, uh, an agency or a convention, a COP for the ocean, which is exactly what has been kicked off in, uh, in Brest earlier this year, and which will be followed up in, uh, in Lisbon next June with the big UN Ocean Summit, trying to bring together all specialists and create the same kind of COP climate movement that we have, but for the ocean, trying to create some uh, some uh, uh, some global regulation, indeed, which is high, which are highly needed. Uh, uh, so uh, so we need to in, indeed to monitor what's going on, to share best practices, to create standards, and to ease licensing and so forth, in order to uh, to establish more seaweed farms in a way or another, and make sure that they have only a positive impact on the ocean, absorb carbon, and restore uh, a life uh, underwater. So that's uh, one thing. Well, farming on land is, uh, is maybe interesting for some aspects. Uh, you need a high quality, uh, high valorization, and you need to understand. I think if you want to really go to go massive, uh, you will need to go uh, uh, on op in open seas. Uh, there's a project of uh, Namibia, for instance, which is growing uh, these giant kelp seaweed, uh, which will, they will grow at 40 centimeters a day. They will harvest the seaweed every three months. They will sequester as much carbon as the entire emission of Netherlands in one single, single firm, from and recreate a, an, a, 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 a system at, in the ocean where there's nothing right now because the very few fishes that are there are overfished. So once again, they will recreate life. They will recreate an artificial forest in the ocean, but it will normally obviously boost life because as you mentioned, because of a starfish uh, disappeared in California, the starfish was eating the urchin and yeah. it disappeared because of yeah, climate change. Uh, so it led to the extinction of this, one of the biggest seaweed uh, forests in the world we have, which was of California. Uh, and 80% of this seaweed forest uh, disappeared, which led to the extinction of 750 different species of uh, animal and vegetal uh, in, in this part of the world. So that's critical. We have to understand how to mitigate that. Uh, seaweed are incredibly complex organisms. So we need to understand how to restore them. They can speak to each other. I mean, if they are eaten by a, by a mollusk or something, they can communicate uh, between themselves and tell, okay, we need to create that toxin because uh, the mollusk doesn't like it. And if it's not enough, they can uh, produce some other toxins that we call for the predator of the mollusk. So they will be able to call for fish and crabs to protect themselves. So they are incredibly complex. So we need to understand how to reproduce that protection. That's where science is very, very needed. And there's a lack, a huge lack of science in the Western world. And that's maybe the most critical problem. Today in the world, we know how to cultivate 10 to 20 different seaweeds out of 12,000. And we only know well how to cultivate uh, the Asian seaweed, basically. So it's like you want to start, uh, you want to start, uh, you want to start agriculture in Canada, but you only grow, uh, you only know how to grow 
uh, banana, rice, and goyava, you know, so that's not easy. So we need to understand that level of complexity for our endemic species. We need also, as you mentioned, it's going up north because the cold water are now in the north. And I can tell you that the Faroe Islands, Greenland, and so forth, they have an amazing business around seaweed growing very fast. Alaska is seen as the next uh, 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 cold rush, I mean, uh, in some extent, <laughs> uh, because uh, there's a fast growing uh, uh, creation of seaweed farms over there. Because once again, all this seaweed, are, so we need to adapt. I mean, the problem is that the, the change is going too fast. So seaweed cannot really adapt to the uh, ongoing change at the moment, while they have 2 billion years of experience and adaptation to the, uh, to the external world. They, so we need to help them. We need to understand uh, how to adapt uh, to these new uh, conditions in California, how to recreate these conditions somehow, and how to uh, make the most, I mean, how to, uh, protect life uh, in these cold water that are opening up north because, I mean, of course, it's opening in Alaska, but up north again, I mean, there are uh, waters that were iced until now and that are now uh, going to be available for cultivation or for uh, um, for, for growing seaweed somehow. So, so we need to get, I mean, uh, once again, flexible as well and uh, adapt ourselves to this new situation. Okay, okay, so are... let's have a few facts now, uh, because this is a bit going out of hand. First of all, China. There's a lot of uh, what I hear uh, sentiment about big farms in China and mega farms. That's not the case. There's a lot of small time people that farm seaweed and they work in co-ops, they collect it together and then it's sold to the world market. In the beginning years of China, they were using fertilizers they would have earthen pots that they would put in their farms and it would leach fertilizer because there was no overload of nitrates and phosphates. It's only in the latter years that a lot of runoff and yes, there is no fertilizers needed anymore because there is plenty going into the sea. In China, they do have impact systems. They grow shellfish and fish and seaweed in the same system. So one feeds the other. So it's not that bad that people seem to perceive it. That, that's one. The climate that we are talking about with higher temperatures, uh, species moving north, yes, that's correct. One way to circumvent that is trying to build ecotypes. So that is genetic process making uh, different species, looking at what can withstand higher temperatures and then try to grow these again and try to restore a kelp forest. But the biggest problem was actually the urgent sea order issue uh, mm -hmm. and that sea otters were basically hunted out of exist existence at some time, urchins eating all the young kelp and the uh, kelp forest disappearing. So there, there is, it's not all that bad as people look at that. That's, that's one point I want to make. And yeah, the carbon I, capture. The, go ahead. Yeah. I just want to jump to something which we haven't covered, which was um, back in the 80s when we had the, the oil crisis, <clears throat> The US government and GE got together and they were all about using seaweed as a potential oil source. And they put quite a lot of money into it for about 18 months. And then when the oil prices dropped, crisis over, all the funding axed. Yeah. So but we had this alternative, and, but we had this alternative, you know, 40 years, of, you know, there's been others, but the seaweed option was available 40 years ago. We didn't act. So do you think that in the cl current climate situation, there is a solid chance that seaweed will be used as a biofuel, as a constant, um, or is it going to, is, is no. it oil too attractive still? Well, no. well oil, seaweed, you can't make oil. Fat levels in seaweed is very low. It's only 2% of the dry weight. You can so convert how do you make it to bio, you can convert biofuel. to bioethanol. So bio bioethanol is- Same as sugar cane. Yeah. yeah. But why would you grow a high value crop that can be used for food, bioplastics, or something else, and turn it a very low value fuel? Good so point. That, that's, that, that, that's not going to happen. So it's uh, not a good economic uh, equation for you. No, no it's a feas exactly. feasibility yeah. is not there. And now we have ele ele electric cars as well now. So we're moving towards hopefully that if we can power them. We don't run out of, of um... with sustainable energy sources. Yes, mm -hmm. if we still burn peat or oil or whatever to generate electricity to fuel our car, mm -hmm. uh, same mm -hmm. same thing. Mm -hmm. But no, yeah, I, 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 I to mention 
something on the carbon capture here because mm. we always say oh seaweed's great and, and uh, can absorb carbon yes in when it's in the ocean it absorbs carbon that's correct mm -hmm. but what you do with the seaweed afterwards is the important factor if you take the seaweed out and use it in feed food or whatever carbon is released so there is no carbon sequestration in that case at all if you use it like what sean is saying in soil uh, together, for example, with fish weights as a nitrate source, yeah, then you start to sequester carbon because it has an effect on the soil and the plants themselves that grow, but also on mineral fractions in the soil that can bind the carbon. And then you lock it up for 50 years, or maybe 100 years. So that is a very clear thing to understand. Mm -hmm. see, don't see seaweed as the carbon solution. Depends on what you do afterwards. I see point. it as a carbon transfercation. So you take up carbon, goes into seaweed, and then you can sequester it depending on your application. Um, another point that you mentioned, which is worth talking about, is uh, if you add red algae to cattle feed, apparently you can reduce methane production in beef cattle by 99%, so said Time magazine. Uh, if that's true, why aren't farmers jumping on board uh, with this brilliant way to reduce carbon emissions? We're working on it. <laughs> yeah, I think um, with definitely methane, uh, decreasing methane for livestock is a, is a project that we're unveiling now, but we're just starting with one sugar kelp species here. Um, I think the red uh, kelp that you talked about, Mary, I've seen that in um, New Zealand area. There's been some breakthroughs, it seems like. Uh, in Australia, but here we're just beginning uh, the trial phases of, of uh, sugar kelp, which is a different species. So um, we're way behind on the science on that one. So I think Stefan would probably once again be our scientific uh, perspective on it. But our understanding is that just small amounts of kelp added to, um, to livestock feed definitively has methane reduction. Uh, but we're just now doing pilot runs and sampling. What we can tell you is that the sheep, goats, cows love it. Um, and the farmers have to keep it away from a lot of the uh, hide it. Otherwise the goats will actually knock down doors to get to it. They absolutely love uh, kelp and seaweed in their, uh, in their diet. So, um, but as far as scientifically proving, like Stefan said, I've learned to stay in my lane and not speak about the science yet until it's proven and factual. As Vince was saying, a lot of this stuff is being developed, but we need a lot more scientific research, a lot more of what Stefan is doing to actually validate it. So there's not hype and hoopla, a lot of this frothing at the mouth about kelp and seaweed. We are very committed to having everything rooted and based in science. And we just don't have the science yet uh, to comment on methane reduction yet, but we're working on it. Vincent, have you got anything to pitch in about that? About no, no, I'm fully aligned. I mean, uh, the Aspartoxis taxiformis, you mentioned it, it is a small seaweed uh, that's growing mostly in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, it's a small one. We don't really know how to cultivate it. We don't have any feedback on the effect uh, of this uh, small seaweed on the on the microbiome uh, in the guts of the of the of the cows. We don't really know what will be the impact on the meat and on the milk. I mean, the, we need science once again. We should be driven by science and uh, we should more experience, we should get more feedback. We should make things right and do not over promise what we can do with seaweed. Mm. Uh, so we know that seaweed in general is very good for microbiomes of the, uh, and good for the uh, animals, just as good as it is for human, by the way. So it improves digestion. I mean, uh, a lot of uh, organization in, in US or in Europe are cutting the use of antibiotics by using seaweed as a source of feed for animals, which is a good thing in itself, because as you know, antibiotic resistance is one of the biggest threats for our world. And um, so cutting the use of antibiotics is a good thing as such. We know that feeding uh, um, uh, livestock with seaweed improves uh, the quality of the livestock. I mean, the most uh, expensive and the most uh, uh, yeah, uh, ships in the world are from the north of uh, Scotland. Uh, where they are only fed with seaweed, that the only animal in the world that are only fed with seaweed, they are the, the ships that are served to the Queen of uh, England. Uh, so, uh, so once again, it's good, it's beneficial uh, for them, uh, 
in, Scand in, in, in Iceland, they are feeding animals for ages with seaweed. So uh, let's start with this. It has some benefit on methane. Uh, it, it depending, I mean, we are also very, uh, we are starting to ferment seaweed and see how we can improve uh, even not only the, uh, the, 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 the red seaweed. Once again, seaweed has an unlimited uh, uh, potential for innovation. Uh, it will take time to explore all of them. Methane reduction is one of them. Let's, let's, let's explore it right. Okay. But in general, seaweed, 10 to 15% reduction in methane. Yeah. Asparagopsis. Oh, not 99%. That was no. Time Magazine. As, as, asparago was... Asparagopsis, which uh, is the red seaweed. That reduces okay. 99%. Okay. And so I was this right. is interesting for you, Vincent. On uh, Cuisson, uh, there was a company called Algae et Mer, and they were cultivating asparagopsis for the cosmetics industry. And we have done this in Ireland as well. We got the methodology from them. And we can grow asparagopsis, but the yields are, are so low uh, per meter yeah. of row, it, it is not doable in that respect. Uh, secondly, uh, iodine in asparagopsis is sky high, 15,000 ppm. So any application in animal feed is under the EU law, not even allowed, because you have way too much iodine. And then mm -hmm. the bromine itself, the jury is still out if that is harmful or not in the animal for the environment. So. I would say leave that for the time being. Mm. Just use seaweed exactly for the reasons Vincent is telling about gut biome. And we have actually done trials and we are now selling this as a product for poultry farmers to take the antibiotics out of the feed mm. because of the seaweed. That's great. Yeah. That's wonderful. All right. Um, we've got a lot of questions here, even though I've got more of mine. I, I want to get to people's questions here. So somebody's asking on food safety in the marketplace, there are a lot of seaweed processed options filled with additives. How do you ensure the cleanness of your food products? Oh, great question. And I'm happy, I'm happy to report that uh, Vincent's organization started uh, a traceability task force. So the Montauk Seaweed Supply Company has been a member of the Safe Seaweed Organization for about a year now. And one of the panels that we uh, signed up with, is, which has been amazing, it's about 18 or 19 uh, seaweed or kelp, a sea vegetable, Vincent, I should say, sea vegetable practitioners, activists from around the world that are now taking lessons from all different uh, aspects of food production and building models for traceability. Ultimately, um, that question of knowing like where exactly your sea vegetables are coming from um, you know, we've learned a lot of those lessons in seafood. The, the U.S. has a rampant seafood fraud situation with mislabeling and things like that. Um, so, but we've, we've made a lot of breakthroughs. We have a lot of different technologies that are now transferring over into the sea vegetable sector. So ultimately, and if we can speak for ourselves, our packages each have um, QR codes that bring you directly to accurate electronic traceability to the source that actually have the farmer, the region, the methods, all that information right on the label. But I think back to Vincent's original point, without some type of policing agency that's enforcing that, uh, it's going to be a work in progress for a while. But um, I'm happy to report that uh, thanks to Vincent's organization, there is a traceability task force that's, that's focused exactly on these issues. Because I was very concerned after the um, Fukushima incident in Japan, um, I stopped buying kelp, uh, any kind of seaweed that came from Japan because I was so sure it's going to be irradiated. It's going to be radioactive for the next God knows how long. I know it's got iodine in it, and hopefully that will counter the radiation. But I'm not convinced. But and nobody's checking it for radiation, are they? I bet they're not. <laughs> uh... What would you say, Stefan? Is it possible to keep radioactivity in something that's inert? Well, uh, we had this discussion before. Eh? In, in, here in Ireland, we have an institution that goes around uh, at least once a year, measures seaweed for uh, radioactive background. Uh, but mm. that is here. I know from Fukushima, yes, there was just a year after the accident, or even up to two years after the accident, they found a, a, a slightly elevated background reading in the seaweeds. But as far as I understood, most of this radioactivity went with the currents and all ended up in California, America, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but that, that, that raises the question of internal regulation on seaweed, and that's something that is highly missing at the moment. Not yes. for radioactivity, but mostly for iodine. 
the, the regulation is in the US uh, and in Europe, so let's be, uh, is absolutely irrelevant uh, when it comes to iodine or cadmium level and so forth. So we are working, I mean, typically for iodine, this is 100 times lower in, uh, in US as the tolerance for iodine than it is in Japan where they have seaweed every day and it makes next up 10% of their meat, of their diet. So we need to harmonize regulation and we have started the work with FAO on that in order to create a global regulation for seaweed uh, recorded at the Codex Alimentarius level, which is the highest priority for food safety. So we need, and, and the same for the environment, the same so for the worker safety, same for the product packaging, we need to have consistent and, and meaningful regulation. And that's something that can only be addressed uh, collectively, which is why we have created this coalition also work collectively on this and to speak with one voice uh, to the global authorities, to the UN, to and, and, and so forth, because we need to make things uh, better than it is today if we want to create a global market here, mm. secure the, the, the consumer. Okay, somebody else has asked here, <laughs> is there an opportunity for citizen voters to be involved in setting their own kelp lines for carbon and nitrogen capture? I'm hoping for a set and forget type of effort. I don't know what that means. I think it's um, very hard no. to get the right, uh, to get the license to cultivate seaweed is highly complex. I think in the US it's easier to pump oil from the ocean than to, uh, than to grow seaweed. Um, because there's a lack of uh, environmental uh, guidelines and uh, in the Western world, and because it's new and it scares everyone, people, and uh, local authorities are wary of, uh, of uh, giving a uh, grant of granting licenses, it's very complex, unfortunately. Uh, to grow seaweed in the ocean. And here again, we have to adapt uh, to the change uh, uh, and, and each and every consumer. And if you want to be a citizen uh, seaweed voter, then you have to eat seaweed. You have to consume uh, each, each time you eat and you drink, uh, three times a day you are an environmental activist. You vote for the world you want. So if you start to investigate where to buy seaweed, where to buy product made out of seaweed or fed with seaweed or whatever, then you start to change the world. Uh, so I think let's start there, <laughs> because uh, small farms in the ocean, there's a long way to go, unfortunately, but uh, why not? And uh, rinsing or washing uh, might help at home, but, but almost anything nowadays coming out of the ocean has microplastics. It's a fact of life. Yeah, and that's, we have the same question with, uh, with the heavy metals, of course, which is about the same process. And bear in mind, that uh, these particles they are uh, concentrating uh, across the the food the food chain. Mm. So you will have more heavy metals in tuna or salmon or wild, wild salmon than you have in seaweed. So if you have to be concerned about something, let's get concerned with tuna and salmon more than seaweed. That's, that's the basic uh, answer. Good point. Okay, someone says, how will future harvesting of vast amounts of sea vegetables impact marine animals in the area of harvest? How will it be harvested and will marine animals be harmed? I'm, I'm just answering that here. <laughs> you have to say it though, because they... yeah, no, no, I know, I know, I know. This is a closed. Yeah, no, we, we normally grow seaweeds often in areas uh, where there's nothing else in, in uh, uh, activity eh? or fishing or whatever. So what you then create is basically an oasis, if you, if you make comparison with land, in the middle of an area where there is nothing. So it will actually work the other way around. Fish will come down mm -hmm. to, the, to yeah. the area because it's interesting. Small critters will live on the, on the seaweed. They eat that, they spawn in the seaweed. With the fish, the bigger sea, uh, animals will come, seals and things like that. So it will increase biodiversity and, and can actually act as a hatchery for fish. So having seaweed farms could, for example, restore cod stocks that have gone down quite a bit uh, over the last 20 years. So I see it only as a positive thing. Yeah, and there's, there's, if, I, if I may add something, there's a misperception here. Uh, uh, I typically, my, in, in the south of France, I mean, we had the same problem. We opened the biggest seaweed farm in France and one of the biggest in Europe with 300 hectares. There was a lot of protest for uh, local authorities and fishermen. And my, my brother will know his fishermen there. And after 10 years, I can tell you that he's very happy. He was protesting against it, but now he's very happy because he's got way more fish than he had before. Uh, and that misperception, it, it's the case in Britain, it might be the case in Cari Caribs and, 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 and I mean, with the invasive uh, seaweed sargassum and, and the green seaweed tides in Britain. Bear in mind that these seaweed tides are wild seaweed first. They are undomesticated seaweed, okay? 
so we, we have no control on them and they are not the problem as such. I mean, of course they create, they, they destroy life in the ocean and on shore, but they are a consequence of a problem. And the problem is the abusive use of pesticides and pollutants on land, which is ending up in the ocean feeding uh, this organism, this wild organism. So they are a, a consequence uh, of a pollution. They are a symptom of the problem more than the problem by themselves. So if we, and, and if, if you look at, as mentioned by Stefan, I mean, know that in China, they don't even have to use pesticides because they have so much waste, so much runoff from the land uh, uh, that they can feed their seaweed with them. But the good thing is that they are, they are not going, I mean, they are not having wild seaweed there. They have domesticated seaweed. So they can harvest this seaweed and, and, and re-enter the cycle for phosphorus and nitrogen. So when we are, we will run out of phosphorus, of phosphorus in 20 years time, which can, which may sound marginal, but I mean, at the end of agriculture, full stop, uh, if we don't have any phosphorus. In China, they have learned and they are learning to recycle their phosphorus from the ocean using seaweed. And in six years time, they will be neutral in phosphorus in China using seaweed to reabsorb the phosphorus and to get it back on land. So once again, that's where we need to move from Stonehenge and hunters gatherers to a, a domestication of our environment. Somehow, we, I know it sounds very uh, bad, but with an optimist and, and positive impact on the environment, as mentioned by Stefan. So we, we have to uh, we have to bear that in mind. And, and phosphate is becoming a crisis. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Well, luckily, the seaweed at the moment is not in crisis, except for small places. Um, and things are looking up. I think what we eat and how we eat affects the world around us. And I think you three have all showed to us today that um, seaweed is, is generally a net positive. It helps us all to eat healthier, more sustainably and lower down the food chain, which is all good stuff. So uh, kudos uh, to all you three for your work. Um, um, just before we go, Stefan, the work that you're doing in India and Morocco, what, what, what's the nature of that? Uh, is, is that offshore farming again? Well, it, it, it's farming indeed. In, in India, we have two places on, in Tamil Nadu, the east coast, and in Lakshwadeep, which is an island group uh, west of India. And we grow a farm, Grasalaria, there for our own operations, for the animal feed, for the horticulture, for other applications, uh, health supplements, for example. So it helps socially because we create a lot of jobs in areas where there wouldn't even be jobs. Mm -hmm. uh, we work with the local coops and fishermen and they learn to farm seaweed. And we help them to set it up with everything and anything. And we have a lot of support from the government there as well to do this. Very good. It's not the sort of thing you would immediately associate with India, I have to say seaweed, but it's great that it's, it's got application. No, but they want to become... Uh, a global player and right, now they're right. not even in the top 10. Right, right. Okay, well, I would like to keep going on about this, but of course you guys, it's extremely late in Europe and you all have other things to do. Stefan's just finished harvesting uh, seaweed this very day, so he's probably I still quite need tired. my dinner. <laughs> quite tired. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, thanks to all our three brilliant guests today, Dr. Stefan Kran, Sean Barrett and Vincent Dumazel who joined us from three different countries to share their time and their knowledge with us um, and added to a very rich global discussion about this. So thank you very much for your uh, input.